Hello, and welcome back to our um, continuing journey from Chapter 6, Skeletal System Material. So in this video, I'm going to cover blood supply to the bone, um, calcium storage in the bone, what we call the dynamic nature of bone, and hormones and how they regulate this blood calcium level and some other aspects of bone growth. Um, the first thing I want to talk about before we jump into the blood vessels, because I don't have a PowerPoint slide specifically for this topic, is just this idea of bone remodeling and the effects of exercise on your skeleton. So your, you may have heard like we replace our bones every seven years or you know some kind of statistic like that. And that's not totally untrue. It's not an old wives tale or an urban myth or anything. We do um, are constantly changing and replacing our bone, but it's not all at the same time. So for example, our spongy bone is going to be replacing itself way more frequently than our compact bone of our bones. So in the notes, it says young adults have about a fifth of their skeleton replaced every year, but not all parts equally. So for example, spongy bone might be turned over two to three times a year, whereas compact bone, say like in your femur, may become relatively unchanged throughout your entire lifetime. So it's not an equal distribution of turnover of your, your skeleton. And it does depend on your environmental influences. So the, the diet that you have, the amount of exercise or lack of exercise that you have will all have these impacts on how your bone responds and changes over your lifetime. So when we talk about exercise on bone, right? So let me draw a bone here. Kind of a little cartoon bone. That's I don't even know what bone that would be. Um, and then let's say we have um, a muscle attached to that bone. Okay, so you are going to be using that muscle to pull on the bone. And as you do that, your bone is responding to that change saying, okay, so as the muscle is getting stronger, I need to make that attachment point of where the muscle is attaching, I need to make that bigger. And as the muscle gets bigger, right, we'll just say bigger muscle, woo, really pumping the iron, that bone marking itself is going to get bigger, right? It's got to be able to withstand the tension being pulled on it from this bigger muscle. Now, if you stop building your muscle, right, um, I'll probably erase everything. Let's see, see if I can just erase some of the size of my muscle. So if you get smaller muscles, your markings will also reduce. So if you wanna increase the density of your skeleton, lift weights, do weight bearing exercises. The more your muscles pull on your bones, the stronger and the denser your bones will become. If you lack weight bearing exercises, your bones will be less dense and more susceptible to damage and osteoporosis as you age. So it's a direct connection because your bones respond to that stress. And a kind of cool way they do that is when you actually get that pulling here, there's, um, because of the crystalline nature of the bone matrix, those crystals kind of rub and get pulled on each other and they make this little electrostatic charge that attracts osteoblasts. So all those bone makers are attracted to that area of where the muscle's pulling on it and where you have osteoblasts you lay down bone. So it's a cool chemical, biochemical reaction between the pull of your muscles and the response of your osteoblasts to lay down new bone. It's totally cool. Okay, so blood supply. Blood, bones are very vascular and bones repair. So if you've ever broken a bone, you know it doesn't stay broken. It heals itself. It takes a long a little bit longer than say like a flesh wound, but bones do heal. And the reason why they heal is because they're very vascular. Typically tissues that are highly vascular can repair themselves and tissues that are avascular don't repair themselves very well. So cartilage is avascular. It does not repair itself very well. <clears throat> the main exception to that is skin. The dermis of skin is very vascular. Epidermis is avascular, but there's a close enough connection between the stratum basal and the papillary layer of the dermis to, to feed those epithelial cells little skin tangent there. So when we are taking a look at the blood supply into a bone, if you remember in our endochondral ossification, we had that artery growing into the diaphysis 
during the very beginning of like the primary ossification center, you keep that blood vessel, the, the arterial flow for the whole rest of your life. It's called the nutrient artery. And so that branches in, it goes into your marrow cavity and just branches like crazy. And that feeds your bone marrow. Um, <clears throat> and then we have our metaphyseal arteries. And those are the same arteries that penetrated into the epi epiphyses for the secondary ossification center. You again, keep all of those through your entire lifetime. They do connect to each other. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, through the epiphyseal plate. So, and they're all interwoven and connected. And then along this, we kind of zoomed in. This is a picture over here. Um, from a different resource, but here we can see those perforating canals going deeper this way and our central canals going parallel in that direction. So these perforating canals, these Volkmann's canals that bring the blood into the central canals are branches off of this nutrient artery that's found outside um, the bone in that periosteum. Sometimes they're called periosteal arteries um, right here periosteal arteries and veins, and we can see those become our perforating arteries and veins. Okay. All right, so that's our blood supply. The next thing I wanted to talk about is calcium regulation. So our bones store a lot of calcium. We're going to see that I have a pie chart here at the end. But I wanted to talk about the hormones that are involved in regulating blood calcium. This is a negative feedback regulated mechanism. So if your blood calcium levels get too high, it triggers a response. If your blood calcium levels get too low, it triggers a response. The ultimate goal is to maintain normal, healthy blood calcium levels. So I think it's like um, 8.5 to 11 milligrams per deciliter is the range, right? So here we're going to start if, what if? What if our blood calcium levels drop below that lower limit? of 8.5 milligrams per deciliter. We have a gland, we, well, we have a couple glands. So in our neck, we have our thyroid gland. So it's about right here, like a horseshoe that kind of wraps around your trachea. On the back side of it, there's four little bean-like glands that sit on the back of your thyroid and they're called the parathyroid glands. And they release a hormone called PTH. You could probably guess what that stands for, parathyroid hormone. That's easy. So from the parathyroid glands, they're monitoring your blood calcium levels. And as they're monitoring your blood flying by, they're going to say, hey, whoa, whoa, that blood calcium is too low. It's getting close to or below that 8.5 limit. So what it does is it releases hormones, PTH, into the bloodstream. And then that PTH has all of these different targets. Okay. So in the bone, PTH stimulates osteoclasts. And remember, what do osteoclasts do? Bone breakers. So they start dissolving bone matrix. And what's in the bone matrix? Calcium. So high pH levels increase osteoclast activity, releasing that stored calcium into the bloodstream. Blood levels go up. Okay, That's one target. The next target is your intestinal lining. Right. So when you consume calcium, it gets absorbed across your intestinal epithelium in the presence of PTH that calcium reabsorption or absorption increases. So we're increasing more of a dietary calcium and that will increase our blood calcium levels. Lastly, along with its friend calcitriol, which remember we came from vitamin D back in the integumentary system, it increases calcium absorption at the kidneys. So your kidneys filter your blood. And so in the presence of PTH and cal um, calcitriol, well, calcitriol helps with the calcium absorption along the intestinal tract, but PTH in the, in the presence of PTH in your kidney tubules, any calcium that would normally get peed out gets conserved and increases blood calcium levels. So we have all of these targets that PTH functions on to be able to increase your blood calcium levels. So we start taking it out of bone because that's where most of our calcium is stored is in our bone. It helps us increase more dietary um, intake. We don't eat more, but of what the calcium that we do ingest, more of it is absorbed. And any calcium that's in the blood that gets filtered to the kidneys gets reabsorbed and put back into the bloodstream. 
So three targets of PTH to increase our blood calcium levels. Okay. Well, what happens if it gets too high? All right, so here is our next diagram to show you what happens when blood calcium levels go over our limit, right? So we have 11 milligrams per deciliter is our high. So you might be saying, Corey, this diagram looks just like the other one, but it's blue instead of red. And you are correct. It is very similar, but it's not exactly the same because our goal is to decrease blood calcium levels, not increase. So that thyroid gland of where parathyroids were located, now we're gonna focus on the thyroid gland itself. It releases a hormone called calcitonin. It does target the same three body parts, your bones, your intestinal tract, and your kidneys, but it's gonna have an opposite reaction. So on the bone, it's gonna slow down your osteoclast. So they're not releasing as much calcium into the blood. So again, that's gonna decrease blood calcium levels. In this diagram, it says osteoblasts are unaffected. I will point out there are some resources that find that calcitonin actually increases osteoblast activity, which allows them to take calcium out of the blood and lay it down onto bone. So if that, even if that's the case, it still decreases blood calcium because it's taking calcium out of the blood and depositing it back into bone. In the intestines, it decreases calcium reabsorption which decreases blood calcium. And in the kidneys, it causes them to pee out more calcium. So you release calcium in your urine. All three of those targets decrease blood calcium levels. So again, PTH and calcitonin work to maintain blood calcium levels in this negative feedback mechanism, right? So if it's 11 is the top, 8.5 is a lower limit. So if your blood calcium levels get too low, PTH is gonna come in and bring that back to normal, right? So there's the negating. Stimulus is going down, response is going up. If your blood calcium levels get too high, calcitonin comes in, right? Stimulus is going up, the response is in the opposite direction. Beautiful example of negative feedback between PTH and calcitonin. These hormones are called antagonistic because they work against each other. They're going in opposite directions, if you will, to maintain your blood calcium levels. All right, so make sure you're comfortable with PTH and calcitonin, all of its targets and the effects that each of those hormones have at maintaining um, healthy homeostatic blood calcium levels. All right, just some other hormones. Um, this is a table from your textbook. So we already talked about um, calcitonin and PTH. So calcitriol, we kind of mentioned briefly, calcitriol comes from the kidneys, right? Made via your vitamin D, um, cold calciferol, liver, kidneys, making your calcitriol, helps to increase absorption along the digestive tract. The other hormones that we didn't see prior to this table is growth hormone. Growth hormone comes from your pituitary gland, which is like right in the middle of your brain. Um, and it stimulates osteoblast activity, which is gonna help you make bone matrix. Kind of makes sense, right? Growth hormone you'd expect to make your bones grow. So it's very active in children. It's not as active in adults um, because we're pretty much done growing our skeleton. Thyroxine, which is a thyroid gland hormone, it's different cells in the calcitonin, but it also stimulates osteoblast activity and synthesis of bone matrix. So these guys are what we call synergists. They work together to reach the same goal. And then we have sex hormones, estrogens and androgens like testosterone. They also stimulate osteoblast activity, synthesis of bone matrix. Um, and estrogens stimulate that. These sex hormones close up those uh, epiphyseal plates um, in puberty. So you kind of get your big growth spurts because of your growth hormone, your sex hormones, but then they close it up. And so usually around towards the end of puberty, that's when you reach your adult stature because those um, plates close sooner, um, or especially in girls. They close sooner in girls because estrogen um, kind of outpaces that epiphyseal closure. So that might be uh, in general why men sometimes, um, again, in general, there's always exceptions, men are taller on average than women because they allow a little bit more time of growth during puberty before those epiphyseal plates close up. 
And then lastly, here's just a breakdown of the calcium and mineral reserves. So again, here's that one third, two third ratio. So right, we had about one third of our bone is organic compounds, mostly collagen. And here's our two thirds of um, salts, minerals. And of that, a big proportion of it is calcium and phosphate. And so a huge proportion of those minerals of that two-thirds ratio is calcium and phosphate. And then if we look at the whole body's storage, 99% of the body's calcium is stored in the bones. 99% of the body's phosphate is stored in the bones. So it's interesting that 8.5 to 11 milligrams per deciliter of calcium is just 1% of the body's calcium is in our blood. <sighs> That's not the right kind of plural I wanted. <laughs> there you go. So only 1% of all of your body's calcium is regulated by PTH and calcitonin to stay within this um, 8.5 to 11 milligrams per deciliter. That's a horrible, it's supposed to be a D deciliter okay so that wraps up this um, lesson on blood supply the dynamic nature of bone and how it reacts to um, exercise the pth and calcitonin interplay to maintain blood calcium levels and then the breakdown of calcium and minerals within your bone compared to that one third of all your bone matrix is collagen fibers Okay, I think we got one more um, lesson on fracture repair and osteoporosis. I will see you next time. Bye.